All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming out to our live recording of Between Two Wings. If you're not familiar, it's Four Flights video and podcast series that I fortunately get to host. I get to talk to some amazing people, but I am so excited for today because we get to kick off the world's best aviation event, talking to these amazing women who are inspiring and really breaking barriers in our industry. So I'm Emily Norman, your host, but let's get to these ladies real quick. So if we want to go down the line, just introduce yourself and kind of give your background, um, how you got into aviation, what you're currently doing, all the things. Olga, you want to start? Okay. <laughs> I'm Olga Custodio. I'm retired. <laughs> Thank you. That's my grandson. I'm a retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force Reserves. Um, I started uh, as a T-38 instructor pilot at undergraduate pilot training, then went to pilot instructor training, did eight years active, transitioned to the reserves, and um, I worked at headquarters personnel, and I flew for American Airlines after that. My last aircraft was a 767, retired, and uh, kind of stayed out of flying for a little bit, but last year we bought an airplane. I fly a Turbo 210, and it's been very interesting having been military to commercial to general aviation, so I'm here to learn a lot of stuff. Hi, my name is Claire Schindler. Uh, I built my hours chasing Predator and Reaper UAVs, um, and when I got my time, I shifted over to corporate aviation and flew this Falcon 7X for four years, and I just got recently typed on the Global Express, um, and that's what I do now, international charter flights, uh, mostly US to Europe. Hi, good morning. Morning, yes. I'm Carrie Smith. Uh, I started my career in the Navy, uh, flying F-14s and F-18s, mostly out of Virginia Beach at NAS Oceana. I then went to test pilot school and flew flight tests for the Navy for 22 years. Retired out of the Navy, and now I work for Boeing as a commercial flight test pilot. Um, and in fact, the uh, 777 that's down here in Boeing uh, Pavilion, uh, I'm one of the pilots that flew that in the other night. Hi there, my name is Annie Vogel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am a GA pilot and also an aviation writer. Uh, so I write for a number of different magazines um, and fly incredible airplanes and get to meet amazing people like yourselves and tell their stories and share them with the world. Okay, so obviously they all have really great careers and do some amazing things in the aviation industry, but that doesn't come without struggles and challenging times. So I wanted to dive right into it. What's one of the biggest struggles or fears or just something you had to overcome to get to where you are right now? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, I had to wait over 10 years to start my career. My whole initiative was to um, join the Air Force and serve our country. That was my primary uh, objective and, and goal. And, uh, but the waiting 10 years uh, gave the timing just right, and they were allowing women to fly in the Air Force. So, so I think that was my biggest challenge rejected twice to join the Air Force, but finally got in. Uh, I would say mine is definitely imposter syndrome. Uh, I got my job on this jet quite young. I was 23, and I had 1,100 hours, and I was flying a fly-by-wire jet that went transcontinental with 1,100 hours. Um, and, you know, my class is full of people that were 30 years older than me with thousands of hours of experience, and, you know, it's like their third or fourth type rating. So it kind of took me a while to get in the groove of things, but the more I did it and the more I practiced and learned, the more I felt comfortable doing it, and I've kind of grown to overcome it. I think for me, probably uh, one of my most memorable struggles was learning how to land on the carrier at night. <laughs> lots and lots of practice, and it's just not as easy as it looks. So it took, it took me several, several tries, a little extra practice, um, and I got, uh, I got pretty good at it, <laughs> a little too good at it. You know, when you get comfortable landing on the carrier at night, uh, it, there's probably something wrong. <laughs> so not as cool of an answer, but um, I would say self-confidence. I think a lot of times you doubt yourself and you don't think you're good enough, you're smart enough. And I think there's this perception that pilots are like astrophysicists and uh, crazy mathematicians, and I think that if you really want something badly enough, you can achieve it regardless. And that took some time to convince myself of. 
Yeah, well, these are all struggles we all have to overcome, big or small, whether it's landing on a carrier at night, self-confidence. I was afraid of flying, so I, that's a big hurdle to overcome. But we're flying airplanes now, so it's fine. Um, but obviously, all these struggles, all the hard times, the ups and downs, like you can't do that without mentorship. I think we can all agree that that is a huge thing in aviation. It's the thing I love most about this industry is that everyone is trying to help each other. So what has mentorship meant to you? Is there one person who's really stood out? How would you, you know, get hooked up with this mentor, advice, just what does that mean to you? Well, I think um, along the way you find your mentors. First of all, you have to ask. If you don't ask, then you can't get help. And that's the biggest hurdle, is asking for help. But um, I was very fortunate that um, everyone that I asked for help uh, was there for me and it's in different stages. So um, there was a mentor always along the way and I appreciate all of them. And I'm not here by myself. I have my family support as well, so. Um, I would say for me, it was uh, an aviation professor. She was my safety professor, and I also flew the Aries Classic with her. Um, she was very big on safety, obviously, but what I learned from her was leading by example. She was very adamant. She would put her foot down several times and would just walk out if it wasn't safe, if someone wasn't listening to her. She didn't have a problem saying no. Um, she also taught me how to be a professional and take pride in my craft, like to continue to learn because it's an ever-developing field and to always ask questions. Um, and her being a female pilot was a great example for me. I think being in the military, uh, we have an advantage because you're surrounded by a squadron full of other aviators. So there's kind of built-in mentorship there. But I had to learn the lesson that Olga talked about. You sometimes have to ask if someone would um, either unofficially be your mentor or just help you with your career advice. Um, there was no women really that were in my squadron ahead of me, so I didn't have that mentorship. But the men in the squadron were all very supportive and wanted you to be there and really wanted you to succeed. Um, so I met my greatest mentor at a glider field um, where I was pursuing my glider license and it just so happened he was very passionate about general aviation and had a Lake Buccaneer that he let me fly very often. Um, and it's, I think in general aviation uh, everyone is just so excited to share their passion and you just have to show interest and you'll find somebody that wants to take you under their wing in no time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we all have to find that, whether it's someone you meet here at Oshkosh, someone online, someone through, you know, your flight school or the military. Uh, it's crucial. It's so important. It keeps you going, for sure. So, Olga and Carrie, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the military. Um, you guys were essentially pioneers in this, especially for women from that standpoint. Is it something that you would go back and do again? Um, advice for people who maybe want to go this route? I would do it all over again, <laughs> for sure. In fact, I wish I could do it right now. <laughs> I know you still get to fly the D-38, and um, it's an awesome airplane. For me, military f flying was so, so amazing. And then as ex expensive as uh, flying is, you know, um, joining the military, uh, I think, gives you an additional purpose when you're doing your flight training, when I was teaching the students to make them uh, better pilots going on and, and serving in, in different airframes. So I found a lot of purpose and followed my father's footsteps. He was in the Army. So it gives me um, a, a great satisfaction and I'm very proud that I was able to serve. So. I think that's the biggest thing for me. And anyone who's thinking about the military, everybody joins for a different reason. You know, you start on, well, it's a job, I'm gonna get some kind of education. But once you're in, your mindset changes and everybody's on the same page and you're very proud of what you're doing. So I, I think um, that could be a great option right now um, for, for anyone, but for women, Absolutely. And then they pay for your training as well, so. Yeah, I would do it all over again. Um, I would say do it. Uh, my, my reason for joining was I, I wanted to be a pilot. 
I was um, initially inspired when I saw the movie The Right Stuff. So if you haven't seen that, add that to your list. I saw that in eighth grade, and I watched these you know, military test pilots. It's all about them becoming the first seven American astronauts. And I said, that's what I want to do. And I knew that joining the military was the way to make that happen. And I wanted to fly something with a pointy nose at the end and go really fast and eventually test airplanes. I also had a calling to serve, and I think that played a big part in joining the military. Some, like you said, everybody joins for a different reason. But I think that's why I stayed so long. I really liked what I was doing. I felt that it was a valuable contribution, um, and I just really enjoyed it. And it gave me fantastic flying experience. Uh, had, had lots of things go wrong in military airplanes, so I feel, uh, feel pretty confident in an airplane now. And especially as two women who've gone from flying fighters to flying airliners, what are some of the comparisons there? I mean, I assume you probably picked the fighters over the airliners, or? I think they're very different. Yeah. Um, in in my, my experience, the F-18, I mean, it didn't really have an autopilot. There was an altitude hold. I didn't have a, a, a nav database. Everything was hand jamming in, the lat long of points. Um, and, and your mission is completely different. So you're flying as a, as a single seat, but with other airplanes. Uh, so when I made the transition to commercial airplanes, uh, I wasn't sure how it was going to go, but it's really fun. <laughs> I really enjoy it. I don't get to go upside down anymore. <laughs> but, um, but it's a different kind of challenge. And now you have to manage everything in the flight deck. And it's just managing a really big computer um, and then also having to do the hand flying for test points uh, is challenging because there's a very small margin uh, between the, the low end and the high end of, of where you can be. So you can't overstress the airplane. So it's, uh, to me, it's a new challenge and I enjoy it. Well, for me, it, it was uh, quite interesting because in a 38, we had no autopilot and there was no glass and you had to figure out where you were on a VOR. So it was line of sight going direct. You had to figure that out. Um, so now it's just all touch screen. Everything's perfect. But I started on a 727 as a flight engineer. So set, sitting sideways back then, they had professional flight engineers at the time. But then the airline uh, at American started hiring pilots in that seat and then transitioning up. Um, and then I upgraded on a Fokker 100, nothing but glass. I felt lost without my paper map, so I would take it on the airplane with me. It was like my safety blanket, you know? I was like, I don't trust these computers. I don't know what this is. So it took a while, and then when I upgraded and went to the 767, the first thing I said, how do you turn all this off? I need to know how to hand fly this airplane because if you don't know how to do that, then you don't know what the airplane's doing. So I'm, I'm very much old school that way. Turn all the, the bells and whistles off, fly your airplane, and every chance I could, coming in into Miami, we'd hit, you know, leave 18,000 and I'd, I'd click the autopilot off fly it in all the way to landing. And my best uh, phase of flight is landing the airplane. I'd always have competitions on that. So I have to ask, do you still bring your paper charts along with you when you fly with four flight? No. <laughs> no more safety blanket? Okay, no, no, curious. no more. No more. Yeah. It's okay. They make great uh, Christmas gift wrapping paper as well if you have any extra ones left over. Um, so Claire, you've taken an interesting route. You are seem pretty strong about you know corporate aviation not going to airlines at least for right now. Why is that? Um, just any insight there? And then Olga, maybe you have some insights on the airlines there. Um, so I kind of knew I didn't really want to go to the airlines. Not that there's anything wrong with the airlines, um, but for me, I, I like seeing a direct impact on who I'm flying, and with hundreds of people going, I don't quite get to see that with the airlines. Um, in my job, you know, I'm getting people to meetings, I'm getting people to concerts, I'm getting people to sporting events. I get to see all that. I mean, I've even taken a couple prisoners to jail, <laughs> um, or people to get cancer treatment. I get to see a direct impact on what my flying has done. Um, but also, I'm just a really restless person. I like to travel and do stuff. So uh, it's a very spontaneous job. I never know when and where I'm going. 
I just get like 30 minutes to pack up my stuff and hopefully look at weather and notams and then I have to be in the airplane. So I like the excitement of it all um, and the spontaneity. That's really what drew me to it over airlines. Well, I like commercial because you have a schedule and I could plan my life around all of that. The senior you get, the better it is. So um, at the time, when I started flying in the Air Force, I was married and had a three and a half year old daughter. So um, it was quite a challenge, but um, we made it work. You know, my husband, we've been married for 48 years, and he's been my biggest supporter this whole time. But the schedule, having that schedule was so great because we could plan around the kids. We have two kids. Um, and it just gave me a sense of, of being in control. And that, that was the best part. Spontaneity, yeah, when you're young, you're like, oh, let's go, I don't care where we're going. And, and you hop in and you go, but um, you know, having a family, a schedule was really important. And I, I was able to talk to the passengers. You know, when I was first standing there, when we had time to greet the passengers coming on board, I had this one incident, this lady came up and I said, oh, welcome aboard, ma'am. And she goes, are you my captain? I go, yes. And she looked at me and I was like, is there a problem? She's like, well, uh, I said, you don't have to take this flight. In two hours, there's another flight going to the same place. And I think she got embarrassed and said, no, I'm fine. And she just walked down the aisle. So, But it's just part of the education that people know that women are captains. Women do fly. And it takes a while. The, the mentality, the culture change it's just slowly, slowly getting there, so. Yeah, definitely. We're definitely going to go into that a little bit later. Um, but speaking of the different aviation careers, I know, Annie, you have a career that's a little bit like mine. We're in the business of the kind of general aviation side of things. Um, you're an aviation journalist. I do random content writing for Four Flight and host things like this. So we all know what my title is officially. Um, but tell us about that. Like, what are some of the things that you get to experience by meeting all these people, getting you know sent off to these places to fly aircraft and then write about it and share those experiences with all of us that can't be there? Yeah, for sure. So it really um, changes your perspective. So sometimes I like to say it took my like window seat and turned it into a viewing platform. And although we all sitting here have very different paths and we're in different sectors in aviation, they're all quite intertwined as well and they're all equally important to each other. Um, and so I get to speak uh, to people in every field and fly different airplanes and go on these journeys with, with really inspiring individuals who have a story to share. So, I mean, some of the stuff I get to do is really crazy and, and some of it's pretty low key at like my, my general aviation airport. Um, but each story is equally important and, uh, and yeah, so I hope that's. <laughs> yeah, do you think that, I, I definitely recognize this in my job talking to you know, all of you guys and everyone we meet at these events and stuff, but I think it really influences the way that you are as a pilot. You kind of learn and take a little bit from everyone that you're, that you're meeting and interacting with. Oh, absolutely. I feel like such a more well-rounded individual now that I've flown with like, uh, you know, fighter pilots and um, helicopter pilots and uh, different demo pilots um, in different aircraft. And I've learned, I learn something every day, but especially on every flight, because there's so many different ways that you can do the same thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's opened my eyes to different careers in aviation, different paths. Um, and so when I always hate that question when, when people ask me how did I get to where I got and how do I get to where that person got because it's all so different um, and there's no, there's no set pathway for anybody but it's been, it's been a ride, that's for sure. Definitely. And I mean, it's been a ride. There's lots of things going on in aviation but if you had to kind of focus in on one thing that you'd like to see change in the next five to ten years, maybe it's an organization you're currently working on or pursuing, something you're really strong and passionate about, what are some of these changes you'd like to see? Okay, <laughs> here I go. Well, for me, um, right now, my passion and my ultimate goal is to inspire the younger generation, especially young girls. 
to let them know that they too can be in aviation and, and you don't have to be a pilot, you know, just because we're pilots doesn't mean that that's the aviation career for them. But there's everything any professional can do, you can apply it to aviation. And so I am a big STEM advocate and I think if we go out there and we show these young girls and show yourself the, the big thing is to be accessible and, and be able to talk to these young students because they don't know what they don't know. And if we're not there to help and show them the way and lead by examples, it, you know, and inspire in, in some way. And the mentorship is huge, huge. And not only for the young girls, but the, for the women who are in aviation right now. Because a lot of them start but they just fall off and life happens so it and it's not easy and I think that's retention is the biggest thing that I would like to see change retention for women in aviation um, yeah I would I would say off building off retention I would probably say recruitment um, I feel like from my experience being a women ambassador with my university, we'd go out and we try and get women to come to the school because my school, Embry-Riddle, only had 25% females. So we'd go out and visit local high schools to try to drum up interest in STEM and flying fields. Um, and we found that high schoolers kind of already know what they want to do at that age. Um, so I'd like to actually go younger to like middle school and do that outreach um, and make ourselves more accessible, including more programs with through organizations like Girl Scouts um, and lead them into STEM, build up their STEM programs to gain interest. Yeah, I sense a theme here. It's accessibility, right? Making um, aviation more accessible. Uh, I've more recently uh, found myself doing more events like uh, Girl Scout Aviation Day. There was, my boys are in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, so I help with their aviation badges and just try to show them all the different things you can do in aviation. So that's probably a big one is you don't have to be a pilot. If you want to be a pilot, fantastic. Let's go do that. But it, there's so many other things you can do. So just trying to support that. And I think that's just really important because we're going to be really short of uh, STEM, uh, STEM folks here in the future. So my passions definitely lie within general aviation and um, I would love to see more women and young pilots in general stay involved within general aviation and not just get their pilot's license and pursue careers. I think it's so important to keep people involved in GA um, and that could be through organizations and different um, charitable work to get people involved like the Young Eagles. So. That's my hope. I, like, I've been seeing more young people at my local airport and neighboring airfields, um, and I would love to see more of that and foster that change, so. Yeah, and so I know I think like recruitment or retention is a really big theme here. So before we, you know, we go today and all go off and enjoy, uh, yay, yay, thank you ladies so much for spending your first few hours here with me, by the way. Um, you know, if you have someone who says, I want to get into aviation, or I'm thinking about getting out, what is some advice that you would give them? Okay, so someone who's thinking about leaving this profession or aviation in general, first you have to see why, because a lot of people find excuses. Everything's an excuse. There's, I don't think there's an excuse. Life is not easy, but you have to find the right person to kind of sit down and listen to what you have to say of why do you want to leave this. And if you really want something, you can find a way around it. Always. You can always work it out. So, um, and I don't have the answer to everybody's reason for leaving, but I would say don't give it up and, and keep working at it, you know, um, because if that's what you're meant to do, you have to keep going. Um, I would say brand yourself. Uh, speaking through uh, my specific industry in corporate, it's really hard to get into. There's not like a pathway for airlines that you have. Um, you really have to network, and that's kind of what I did. I went to conferences. Um, I had resumes ready to go. 
Um, you gotta brand yourself. I mean, I you know, have little business cards with a logo on them. Like, be able to hand those out. That's just a way of letting people know who you are. And I think some people, especially young ape, uh, aviators, are scared to go up to those people. Just start up a conversation. And it probably won't lead to an interview right away, but at least like get to know and put yourself out there. Your name's out there then. Um, pro tip also, don't just have printed resumes. Have them on a USB stick, because then they can just upload them. So yeah, brand yourself and go meet people. This is all good advice. I'm right, taking notes. Um, <laughs> I think uh, for me, it's probably just understanding that you're going to fail um, in anything you do. I mean, everybody here, if you're, I'm a parent as well, so <laughs> I fail kind of daily, I feel like, in that role. But there's going to be failures along the way, and to not let that stop you. If, if you really want something, every single person fails at some point. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, figure out what the path is, and move forward. And maybe you take a left turn instead of a right because of something you found out about yourself. But keep going. And um, I think, I'm not going to say the line right, but Nicole Malachowski, she was the first Thunderbird uh, pilot, she, she coined a phrase, um, failure is the price of entry for something great. So anything great that you do, you're probably going to make a mistake. But that's part of the road to get there. That was really well said. Um, so kind of speaking to a few things that everyone just mentioned, I think being present, being excited about aviation, showing up, and um, starting those conversations. I, you know, walking up to strangers sometimes and asking what they fly can be kind of scary or asking them about, you know, what they do for a career. It's intimidating. Um, but that just makes you stand out in their eyes and they probably have some really great advice and some pretty great learnings that they can pass on. Um, I would also advise not to listen to all advice that's given to you. <laughs> Sometimes you'll get some really discouraging things said along your journey um, for men and women and uh, you just gotta like follow your gut and go for it. So. I have a go back. Uh, the other piece of advice that I meant to bring up is ask questions. Um, sometimes when I walk into a room at work, everybody assumes that I know all the answers because of whatever project we might be working on, and that is so far from the truth. And sometimes I feel like I'm asking the dumb question, and I feel if I have that question, somebody else in the room does, and I usually get a lot of nods when I ask it, so ask questions. Yeah, definitely. Never a dumb question either, ask away especially in this industry, for sure. Well, again, thank you ladies so much for coming here. I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I forgot to ask Carrie about something super important that's here, because she actually flew again last night, um, the Eco Demonstrator. So Carrie, please tell us about that a little bit, which you can go visit on Boeing Plaza. Yes, it's here. So the Eco Demonstrator program is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year, um, 10 years of learning. Uh, the motto for the program is innovate, accelerate, and collaborate. So we take innovative technologies out of the lab, put them on a real operational airplane, and go test them and try to accelerate, accelerate how they get to, uh, to the other airplanes. Um, this is our ninth platform. We usually have a different one every year, and this one is a Boeing-owned 777-200ER. We have about 30 technologies on it this year, and we're going to fly it for 6 to 12 months, depending on how everything goes. Um, it's here. You can go to the Boeing Pavilion to take a look and get a tour. I think the tour lines are long, so just plan for that. Uh, I mean, they'll talk to you about some of the technologies uh, that we're working on. Thank you, Carrie, and thanks for the reminder there. Um, again, thank you, ladies, and thank you, everyone, for spending your first few hours of Oshkosh here with us. Um, it's been so great. If you want to watch this all over again, it will be available on the Four Flight YouTube uh, channel later this week, um, and also you can listen to it wherever you listen to your podcast. So hope everyone has a great air venture, and I will see you around. <laughs>